Cognitive control and cognitive flexibility are key to changing your behavior when you feel stuck in unhealthy patterns. Let's dive in and see how this works. Now, the human brain has an amazing capacity for creativity and innovation that we can tap into. And one major part of our brain's ability to come up with creative solutions is its ability to quickly shift between thinking about multiple concepts and equally important, to adapt our behavior to new situations. These two abilities are called cognitive flexibility and behavioral flexibility. In this video, we'll use a story of a common struggle to show how this kind of flexibility, along with our brain's broader capacity for cognitive control, is crucial for our ability to thrive and achieve goals. But first, let's do a quick overview of how the brain employs these abilities. Now, if you want a more in-depth treatment of cognitive control, or actually cognitive flexibility, check out my most recent live stream where I go into much more technical detail. But for our purposes, cognitive and behavioral flexibility are two components of what scientists call cognitive control, or executive functions. Cognitive control is the set of tools our brains use to put our plans into action. It includes things like working memory, emotion regulation, and the ability to stop one's thoughts or behaviors. In general, cognitive control relies on the dynamic interaction of multiple brain networks, especially one called the lateral frontoparietal network. This network includes regions like the prefrontal cortex, the cingulate cortex, the inferior parietal lobule, the temporal lobe, and most importantly for cognitive flexibility, a region called the inferior frontal junction. Okay, I know that's a lot of jargon, so let's just zero in on the inferior frontal junction for now, and then we'll circle back to some of these others later on. Now the inferior frontal junction, or IFJ, sits right at the intersection of two of the brain's major folds, the inferior frontal sulcus and the precentral sulcus. Now we can think of the IFJ as a kind of manager in the brain that helps to switch tasks on the fly. Now, earlier I mentioned that cognitive flexibility and cognitive control are important for our ability to reach our goals by finding innovative solutions to problems. For example, let's say that one of your goals is to improve your diet so you can feel better, lose some weight and live longer, right? Now, the problem is you don't really know what constitutes a healthy diet. In the past, you've tried to rigidly follow a meal plan yet every time you end up reverting back to your old unhealthy eating habits. In general, you feel pretty helpless. You've convinced yourself that you're just not a diet person, that you'll fail no matter how hard you try. And even worse, you know how bad your current diet is for you, and you begin to spiral downward into a feeling of overwhelming catastrophe. Here, we can imagine that your prefrontal cortex is unable to exert sufficient control over a region of your brainstem called the dorsal raphae nuclei, which floods your brain with serotonin and puts the brakes on motivation-related regions. This would be an aspect of cognitive control that you're having trouble with. In mice, when this occurs in their brains, it causes them to give up, to stop trying to overcome stressful obstacles, even when they could easily do so. So you start feeling stressed and frustrated, so then you allow yourself to get distracted. You turn on the TV and just forget about the whole idea. You think to yourself, this always happens, and I'll probably fail another diet even if I try again. But the next morning, you wake up with a painful stomach ache. You suddenly realize that this just isn't sustainable. Something needs to change. And with that, you feel a surge of motivation. You decide that today is the day that you start eating healthy. You make a rigid plan for yourself, and in doing so, your lateral frontoparietal network has instantiated a set of rules for your behavior, intended to allow you to achieve your goal of eating healthily. At this point, you've made a plan to change and begun to take action, but you're relying purely on willpower, which you can think of as your brain's cognitive control networks, constantly inhibiting your conditioned preferences for sugary comfort foods. At first, this seems to be going well, but soon your motivation fades and your desire for sugary comfort foods arises in full force. You might have been able to resist the temptation, except that you're experiencing a particularly stressful time at work right now. So you indulge a little. But the problem is that a little quickly becomes a lot. You give into it, you fall off the wagon, and reignite those familiar, deeply ingrained neural pathways, 
reconstituting your old, unhealthy eating habits. Relying on willpower alone has failed you. In your brain, bidirectional connections between your prefrontal cortex and a set of structures near the center of your brain, called the basal ganglia, are largely responsible for these kinds of habitual responses. Year after year of activating the same unhealthy habit, the binging, sugary, and unhealthy foods, strengthens the neural connections underlying this habit because these pathways are directly connected to regions involved in pleasure and reward. So every time you get that little surge of pleasure from the sweetness, it's a signal to these habit-related regions to strengthen and thereby become more likely to activate. Psychological stress, like what you're experiencing at work right now, tends to make these deeply ingrained patterns even harder to resist. And this means that to really change a habit in the long term, relying solely on willpower is usually ineffective. And now this is even worse because you feel like a total failure. Dark thoughts begin to swirl in your mind. You question your self-worth. You chastise yourself for not having more discipline. Yet a spark of hope remains buried in the back of your mind. It's an idea, a question about yourself that you've been too afraid to ask in the past. For just a moment, you let that question come into consciousness. What if I'm approaching this all wrong? What if the reason I'm not succeeding isn't because I don't know how, but instead because I don't see myself as the type of person who can succeed? What if I've been telling myself a negative story about the kind of person I am? Now at first, this question seems so simple, yet something about it rings true. And then an even more powerful question comes to mind. What if I could change the story I'm telling myself? What if I could make healthy eating a part of my identity as a person? A subtle feeling of peace washes over you. You have no illusions that changing your habits will be easy, but you now feel a far deeper sense of motivation, not to merely take on a new habit, but instead to become the person you truly want to be. Now, in your brain, we can imagine a number of things have occurred. First, you had to have a high degree of cognitive flexibility because you shifted your concept of what it means to be a healthy eater. Your inferior frontal junction may have activated. It might have acted like a switch that helped to reorient your brain, especially those frontoparietal control networks, to start working on this goal in a whole new way. Without this cognitive flexibility, you would have been locked into your old way of thinking and might never have found the new, empowering state of mind that allowed you to achieve your goal. And next, while you were assessing your core values and realizing what kind of person you really wanted to be, it's likely that your orbital frontal cortex and ventral striatum were active. Now these regions are crucial for the process of determining what is valuable to you. Then when you felt a sense of motivation and peace, one change in your brain probably had to do with the prefrontal cortex calming the activity of that dorsal raphe nuclei we mentioned earlier, which turned down that feeling of hopelessness. Additionally, it may have helped to activate a region called the dorsal striatum, which is involved in motivated behavior, possibly giving you that feeling that you can become the person you want to be. And finally, as you begin to shift your identity from an unhealthy eater to a fundamentally healthy person, a region called the medial prefrontal cortex may have been active. This region is crucially important for our sense of self, our identity, who we believe ourselves to be. And just a quick note, I want you to keep in mind that this is a speculative illustration of what might be happening in the brain based on what neuroscientists understand about the individual functions of these brain areas. Yet, like anything the brain does, you should picture these regions working as individual nodes in a network of many other brain regions. No brain region acts alone, but they do have unique contributions to make to the networks that they're a part of. It's those unique contributions that I've tried to illustrate in this hypothetical example, but again, this is hypothetical. Now, as the weeks go by, you find yourself with a much stronger resolve to eat a healthy diet. The stories you tell yourself are more positive and less self-deprecating. You make sure to congratulate yourself for living according to these deep values. This conversation with yourself is likely mediated by a set of brain regions known as the default mode network, as it's involved in self-talk and in daydreaming and related cognitive processes. A key note of this network 
is the medial prefrontal cortex, that same brain region involved in your sense of identity and self. And still, this is not an easy journey. You have to fight deeply ingrained neural pathways of those old unhealthy habits. You still have to exert some willpower to overcome the temptations, but you also make this challenge easier on yourself by controlling your environment more, by throwing the cookies in the trash, cooking at home more often, and spending time with supportive people who want you to succeed in this journey. Occasionally, of course, you do allow yourself to indulge a bit, but now you don't go overboard. You don't binge anymore. When there are fewer temptations and more healthy alternatives, your brain doesn't have to struggle as much to overcome the conditioned preferences for unhealthy options. And finally, you realize that you had often used food as an emotional support, as a mood booster when you felt sad or distressed. To satisfy this need, you decide to substitute in something healthier. And soon you learn about a practice called loving kindness meditation. This is a researched, supported way of boosting positive emotions. So you take 10 minutes, close your eyes, slow your breathing, and picture someone you care about, imagining them at their happiest. You also repeatedly wish them happiness, and then, in the last couple of minutes, turn that wish around on yourself. So slowly but surely, your desires and behaviors become aligned with your deepest held values and this newfound identity. As the months pass by, your tastes change and you no longer crave that sugar binge. You finally achieved this lifelong goal and you feel a great sense of pride in that. As still more time passes, you see that this shift in your identity might help you improve other parts of your life. Every time you face a new challenge in your career or personal life, you see if you might accelerate your progress by assessing your core values and bringing them into the light of consciousness. So from this one experience of personal growth, you've discovered a well of inner strength that increasingly allows you to become that person you've always wanted to be. Now, in my experience, one of the most powerful ways of keeping up with this kind of personal growth is to keep learning about your brain, how it works, and how to influence it to help you achieve the goals that matter most to you. You can get a deeper understanding of your brain just by watching videos like this, but it often really helps to have written articles that you can easily search highlight, and reference. And that's why I provide written versions of all new Sense of Mind videos, complete with lists of peer-reviewed sources that I use to write them, only for Patreon supporters of this channel. In addition, I do a monthly live stream only for Patreon supporters. So if you want to continue learning about your brain in order to accelerate your personal development and just help you feel better on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, I urge you to go to patreon.com slash sense of mind and sign up. To get all these benefits, you need to sign up at the $4.99 tier or higher. But I really believe that if you understand your brain, you're way ahead of the curve in improving your mind and ultimately your life. So check it out at patreon.com slash sense of mind. The link is in the description below. All right, thanks so much for watching this video. I'll catch you next time.